I'm going to give you an introduction to the Fourier Making Waves FET. I really like this simulation. I think it has a lot of really nice, cool tools. So the first thing you'll notice is that you have these different coefficients here from A1 to A11. And so right now you're seeing individual terms here and then the sum. It's more clear if we, for instance, add a second one. Here in the second window, you can see the red one, which is this one, and then the yellow one, which is this one. Now notice that when we look at, for instance, and I'll even add a third one, that all of them start at zero and go up. So these are all sine waves. And if we look over here, graph controls, function of space, we know that because this is x, and it's sine. So they all start at zero and go initially up. Now you can actually make the amplitude negative. So now this one starts at zero and goes down. Now look at what's happened here. I can zoom this out and we see that now this region is close to zero and then it goes up and down, but it repeats over time. So this is a really key aspect that of this type of sum is that you're always going to have this repetition. It's the same shape over and over again, and we can make different adjustments to it, but you're going to see that same adjustment over and over again. And in fact, no matter what I do, the period here is, is staying the same. That overall, t um, sp I keep calling it period, but this is technically space. So the distance, if you will, over which it repeats. So now you can do lots of different, different things and you can see all of the different individual terms here and then the sum here. Now there's a, a few fun things we can do. We can turn on some sound. I don't know in the video if you can actually hear that or not, but one of the things I like about this is that Fourier is not fundamentally a quantum mechanical um, thing. It's, it's something that you actually use to, for instance, do uh, synthesizers. So by electronically generating sounds, we can electronically make, or from a computer, make something like this and make it sound like an instrument. So when I play the sound, I think it sounds kind of like a clarinet. I don't know, maybe this is a clarinetti sort of sound. Um, so that's something to know. The next thing that we can do is we can switch to cosine. And now watch what happens on the bottom here as I switch from sine to cosine, right? It changed a little bit. So sine, cosine, sine, cosine. Right? So the nature, the, the function has changed, not necessarily the distance over which it's repeating, but so think a little bit about your symmetry. Notice that now it's reflected across the, the y-axis, so, uh, well, the x equals zero y-axis, so now there's that reflection symmetry, and before it was more like the symmetry was the other sort, where it's kind of what's happening in the negative direction is what's happening in the positive direction here. Now the next thing we can do is we can go to a function of time. All that has happened is we have changed this axis from saying x to saying t. So this is one important thing to know is that sometimes I'll even misspeak and talk about period or talk about frequency because in sound, where many of us first encountered this sort of Fourier transform, we're talking about time. But in quantum mechanics, we're usually actually talking about wavelength and we're talking about space. But notice that if I say time, versus space, the only change is how we've labeled our x-axis. Now instead we can say space and time, and now that nonsense is moving, yay. And so the idea being if we watch one point, it's going to be going up and down in a certain way, and that's what it would mean to, for instance, be watching only, only time. Now is this a quantum mechanical evolution? No, absolutely not, because all of these waves are actually moving the same way. And one of the things to keep in mind with quantum mechanics is that each of these different wavelengths would correspond to different energies, which means that actually in time, they're not just moving to the side, you have a, a phase changing. So do recognize that this is better for thinking about sound once you start adding together space and time. This isn't a quantum mechanical evolution, though there are, are other simulations that, that do that better. But it's kind of nice to still remember what, what it means to plot in terms of position versus time. So let me go back to position. And now the other thing that I really like with the simulation is we can go up to function and there are different options. So for instance, we can pick a triangle. So now notice down here, this looks, let me zoom in, like a triangle wave. 
Now, not exactly like a triangle wave, because these points aren't quite sharp enough, but pretty close. And notice that there's a pattern here. So we have a pretty high magnitude, zero, negative magnitude, but much smaller, zero, and then much smaller magnitude, zero, and then much smaller, negative. And notice, in fact, this is 0.81, this is 0 0.09. So other than the factor of, say, 100 involved, 9 squared is 81. Then you get to 0 0.03, 3 squared is 9. Again, there's like factors of 100s and whatnot due to the decimals. But now if we took the square root of 3, well, now we're kind of into a point where there's not enough sig figs in the program. So one of the things that I like about this is you can start to see the pattern, and you could even do the math out yourself to say, if I did my Fourier transform for a perfect triangle wave, which is just a line that then goes down, right? So this is one where you can really use symmetry to make some great arguments for the triangle wave that you can then test and see, do you see the right sort of pattern here? Now then we can go to a square wave. And again, now you can look and say, that's a terrible square wave. What would we have to do to make it better? We would have to add a lot more terms, higher and higher ends. But right now we're at the, the highest number of harmonics. And you can see that this, again, due to the symmetry, every other term is zero. But now it's falling off pretty slowly. So even up at A11, we're still at 0.11. And so if we had many, many, many more terms, this would look much more like a square wave. If you have a different program that you use for making plots, I encourage you to actually try playing with this a little bit. And for instance, going to higher and higher terms and adding them together, and eventually you'll see this become a really nice square wave. So something to keep in mind is if you want those really sharp edges, we have to have much, much higher N, and at least in the quantum mechanical sense, that would be much, much higher energy. That's much smaller wavelength. So then we have a sawtooth which is a little bit different than that triangle wave. So our symmetry is different. Now, in fact, we have every term adding. It's not just going to be the every other term. And again, it does an OK job, but you can see that we need much higher terms to make these edges be sharper. So again, higher energies correspond to smaller features. And so if this went higher, we would get those. Um, and then we have the good old wave packet. Now, let me zoom out so you can see what's happening here. And now, notice that this looks like a Gaussian. And that's going to be a key feature, that when we have wave packets, that's going to be a Gaussian distribution. Now, if I go down to space and time, this is not what our quantum mechanical wave packets are going to look like. Our quantum mechanical wave packets are going to behave quite differently. But I really like the fact that you can actually put, let me make that stop, that you can actually go into these different uh, shapes and really see the effect that that has and you can kind of play with it and get a feeling for why it should be one value and not the other. And then what you can do from that is actually go into the wave game where you're trying to match it. Now the first, the first level is pretty easy. It gives you one wave and you're trying to match what's on the bottom, and boom, I got it because I have a PhD. But then if we go up, for instance, to 10, now we have all of these different possible uh, values. So what I find helpful is to kind of say, okay, let me try to find my dominant feature, which is going to be a higher, oh, it's hard to get these back down to zero exactly. Let me see, a higher value. Maybe, maybe the next one. I'm trying to match this shape that I see here. Let's see, is it like that? Yeah, so that looks pretty good. So notice then that even though I've gone all the way up here, it even has to be a little bit higher. So let's make that a little bit bigger. Okay, and then maybe that. Oh, I, I like what's happening. But now I need to make this be more negative. That would be a, a lower frequency. Oh, well, that's been a problem over here. Okay, let's turn this down. You can see it's going to take a while to actually get this to work out. So I think that this is nice because it shows you if you're trying to match by hand, you're kind of thinking through, you know, what components do I see? How do I balance these different functions? So playing this game, I promise I've actually won it before, um, is a great hands-on way to conceptually understand this idea of the Fourier transform, because that's effectively what you're doing in your head by just trying to say, okay, what, 
what frequencies do I see, or in this case, wavelength or wave numbers, um, and you can work your way through. So that's been an introduction to this. Please play around with it because this is a great conceptual visual way to understand this idea of this Fourier transform.